Uh, thank you guys for coming. Uh, let me introduce uh, kind of what we do here. So this is Macrinus Table. Macrinus Table is Crossing Crown Speaker Series geared toward starting intellectual conversations in the local church. Having good conversations about history, philosophy, theology, art, ethics, is an important part of Christian community. Some of the most fruitful periods in church history have come out of good conversation around, for instance, McCrine the Younger's table or Luther's. Today, the church is one of the last places where these kinds of conversations are possible. The church needs it, and so does the world. So who is McCrine? McCrine the Younger lived in the 8300s. When her parents died, she turned the family estate into a Christian community. There, she taught her younger brothers philosophy and theology, and modeled a life of profound spirituality. Their home became a center of theological conversation for the group that became known as the Cappadocian Fathers. Gregory of Nyssa, Basil the Great, uh, are two of Macrina's brothers, and their friend Gregory of Nazianzus. The Cappadocian Fathers helped to formulate and defend the doctrine of the Trinity. Gregory of Nyssa wrote a biography of Macrina, which is, by the way, the first female biography in the ancient world, in which he called her, quote, my sister and teacher at the same time. He also said that she was the only one he trusted to answer the objections of unbelievers to the resurrection of the dead. It's our tradition to pray a uh, prayer that she wrote that's absolutely wonderful. So if you bow your heads, we'll pray. You, O oh Lord, have freed us from the fear of death. You give our bodies, which you have made with your hands, to the earth to rest in safety until the last trumpet sounds. Then you will take our mortal and unsightly remains and transfigure them with immortality. To free us from sin and from the curse laid upon us, you took both sin and the curse upon yourself. You crushed the head of the dragon that had seized men by the throat. You shattered the gates of hell and trampled the devil, death's lord, beneath your feet. You cleared the way for our resurrection. You broke the flaming sword and restored to paradise the man who is crucified with you and implored your mercies. Remember me too in your kingdom. Do not let the slanderer stand against us in the way or let my sin be found in your eyes. If I have been led astray by the weakness of my nature, O oh, you who have the power to forgive sins on earth, forgive me that I may be refreshed. And when I put off my body, let me stand before you with my soul unspotted and undefiled. Amen. Amen. Our speaker tonight is the Reverend Dr. Jordan Cooper. Dr. Cooper is an ordained Lutheran pastor. He received his first call to Hope Lutheran Church in Brighton, Iowa in 2012. He was pastor of Faith Lutheran Church in Watesca, Illinois from 2014 to 18, and then called to the campus ministry at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He has degrees from Geneva College, the Wittenberg Institute, American Lutheran Theological Seminary, and his doctorate is from South African Theological Seminary. He is professor, a systematic, professor of Systematic Theology at American Lutheran Theological Seminary, the Executive Director of Justin Sinner, and the President of American Lutheran Theological Seminary. He's authored several books, as well as theological articles and a variety of publications. He hosts the Justin Sinner podcast, which is highly recommended, and is a frequent guest on many other podcasts. He lives in Ithaca, New York, with his wife Lisa and their two boys, Jason and Ben. Please welcome him for us. Thank you. It's, uh, it's good to be here with you this evening. Uh, and I have uh, about an hour. Is that right? Go I, for it. Okay, okay. I, uh, I can go a long time. So the topic that I was given to, to talk about is one that I've written two books on. So um, I could be here for, you know, I could be here all night. Uh, <laughs> So uh, hopefully it won't, take, it won't take that long, but I'm trying to cover a lot of ground here in a relatively short period of time. So what is the topic that I am talking about tonight? That is uh, theosis. Uh, I was asked to speak about the doctrine of theosis. Now, the doctrine of theosis, when you hear about that from particularly a Lutheran perspective, it probably doesn't sound too familiar. Uh, probably not a term that you hear often in preaching. Uh, probably not a term that you, you know, you don't run into it in Luther's small catechism. It's not something that is particularly common on the lips of a lot of Christians, at least in the modern West. And when I use that term theosis, there is a fear on behalf of some that I am um, 
Eastern Orthodox, trying to bring Eastern Orthodox beliefs into the Lutheran Church. Uh, despite what my beards may tell you, I am not, uh, I, I'm not some kind of secret agent of the Orthodox Church to all uh, convert you to Russian Orthodoxy or something. Um, but I want to talk a little bit about, first, why I got interested in this doctrine and this teaching, and then I'm going to delve into exactly what it is. Um, so we'll start with where, why I got interested in this topic. Why did I set, spend so many hours uh, writing and reading on this particular doctrine that isn't one that seems to be discussed very much, uh, at least in, in a Lutheran context? Well, uh, I became a Lutheran while I was in college. I was studying for a degree at a Reformed undergraduate institution. It was my plan um, to then go to a Reformed seminary, seek ordination in the PCA, and then pursue a, some kind of a PhD to maybe teach it some kind of Reformed seminary or, or college. Uh, and while I was in college, I became very interested in reading the Church Fathers. And, you know, my, my friends, who were all theology majors, we had like a group of guys that all lived together. We all studied theology. We stayed up all night debating stuff. It was a lot of fun. Um, but when we were doing, you know, papers for classes, they were always, they were always drawn to like the Puritan authors. You know, and if, and if you're familiar with any of the Puritans, they were reading like John Owen or a Jonathan Edwards. And for whatever reason, those guys just did not grip me at all, uh, at all. And as a Reformed guy, I felt like they should, especially because I, I grew up where Jonathan Edwards preached in Western Massachusetts, the heart of the Great Awakening. Uh, I had history there, and it, I was supposed to be like kind of proud of my history. But every time I read Jonathan Edwards, I felt terrible. I just felt terrible about myself. If you ever read Edwards, I mean, if you, if you know anything about, about Edwards, you've at least probably heard of the sinners in the hands of an angry God, you know, the, the image of the like God holding you like a spider on its web, ready to like dangle off and fall into hell. Um, and, well, yeah, Jonathan Edwards' sermons were not all quite uh, that terrifying. A lot of them kind of were. And, uh, <laughs> and reading a lot of Edwards, I didn't, I didn't find a lot of joy and delight. Uh, I found a lot of kind of fear, uh, and, and fear specifically about whether or not I was truly a Christian. So the short of it is uh, that... I was kind of looking for something else. <laughs> I, I was looking for, and I, I was reformed in my convictions at the time, but I was looking for something I could really find some kind of joy and delight in. So I was often drawn to, to two things, and one was the Church Fathers, and the other was the writings of Martin Luther. Now, if any of you come from a reformed background, um, you're probably familiar with the fact that reformed people love Martin Luther just because of his book, The Bondage of the Will. And they pretty much don't read anything else. I mean, honestly, that was at least <laughs> my experience was you read that book uh, because according to them, this was the Calvinist version of Martin Luther. Um, but as I began reading more Luther, I started to recognize that he didn't quite sound like the reformed people that I was listening to preaching or being taught under. Uh, and, and I did find a kind of joy and delight in uh, a, a Christianity that was not based so much on fear, fear of whether or not I'm elect, uh, a kind of stern moral rigor, but Luther seemed to like really love Jesus and enjoy life, <laughs> and, and something I didn't have, you know. Um, but along with that, I was reading the Church Fathers, and I found some very similar things in the Fathers um, as, as well, especially when they talked about the sacraments. They started to see Luther talks a lot about these, the sacraments, the Fathers talk a lot about the sacraments, they seem to get a lot of assurance there. They seem to get a lot of joy and, and delight and, you know, sustenance for the Christian life. Uh, but I'm not really seeing that myself. It, and after a, a period of studying and a lot of reading and probably being the, a very annoying student and grilling all of my professors with so many questions, uh, came to the conclusion that I needed to be somewhere that was more historic uh, and somewhere that I could really delight in the gospel, uh, and, and I found that within, within Lutheranism. Now, all of that as a background is not just random biographical information. This is connected to the topic, so I, I am going somewhere with this. <laughs> um, one of the things that struck me as I was initially reading the Fathers 
is that the church fathers spoke a lot about sharing in Christ, being one with God, being united with God. As I read Luther's writings, I also saw that theme, just as I did in the fathers. It's a very, very consistent theme, especially in Luther's uh, 1535 Galatians commentary. It shows up all over the place. Uh, Luther would say things like, Christ is present in faith itself. There, there is some kind of mysterious, mystical union that the Christian has in faith with Jesus' person. It is brought into the divine life in some way. And when I began attending uh, Lutheran, uh, a Lutheran church, uh, the church that I was part of was great, and it was a, you know, there was a, the preacher was, was wonderful. He's a wonderful pastor. And, um, but I didn't really hear about this theme very much. And I just kind of wondered, why, why is it that I don't hear about this theme? And it wasn't just that church, but it was, you know, I was regularly listening to what Lutheran podcasts there were at the time, which was pretty much Issues Etc. at the time. There was like nothing else. And uh, there, there wasn't a lot. And I was reading modern Lutheran materials, and I just noticed when I read Luther and I read Martin Chemnitz and I read, and these are other older Lutheran figures, second generation of Lutherans, this union with God theme just shows up everywhere. But when I start to read a lot of modern Lutherans, they don't ever talk about it. Here, can I, can I ask those of you who are pastors and went to seminary in here? Did you ever talk about the mystical union with God in seminary? Yes? Good. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> because I've, I've, I've talked to so many pastors who have told me, I've never heard of that doctrine before. Never. Never once have I ever heard anyone talk about union with God which I think is very unfortunate because it's a very rich part of, of Lutheran heritage. So I, I began to explore this question, which kind of became the driving question of all of my life and work, uh, kind of incidentally, uh, which was, why did this teaching of union with Christ disappear in Lutheran proclamation? Because it hasn't everywhere. Uh, it, it's still there in Roman Catholicism. Uh, it's still there in Eastern Orthodoxy. It's there in a different way in the Reformed churches, but it's just not in Lutheran writings at all. Uh, and so I began a, an exploration, uh, which eventually led me to my, my dissertation. But my exploration was, was looking at older writings and saying, all right, where did people stop talking about this? Because I'm looking at works from the 19th century, and all of the American Lutherans write about it all the time. And you get to about 1930, and all of a sudden, it's gone. It's re very recent. So what in the world happened? This, this teaching, this doctrine uh, that, that I have received so much kind of benefit, blessing from reading Luther and the Fathers, just, it's missing in our churches. And I think there's, there's richness that we're, we're not receiving. So, um, eventually, it was my goal to write a dissertation on this question of union, of the mystical union. Uh, what I realized in my studies was that what, what became a theological shift really was a philosophical shift first. So I realize, like, all right, I can't just deal with the doctrine. I've got to, like, go back and deal with the basic philosophical assumptions people are working with, because that's really the root of everything. Uh, and hence became my study in philosophy. Uh, uh, this is where, and I always enjoyed philosophy to some, to some extent, um, but this became kind of my primary focus for, for a while was, was philosophy. Um, which I think was was providential because I think there's been some fruit, a, a lot of fruit, hopefully in that in that study. Um, but I began to to look at the roots of particularly modern philosophy and how modern philosophy began to shift how people read Luther, but read the Bible in general. Um, now, when I talk philosophy, you know, people, it's one of those things that people kind of roll their eyes or you know fall asleep or. Uh, you know, uh, or, or try, try really hard not to, uh, and think, you know, this, this stuff is so, like, abstract, it's so out there, it's not really relevant. But once you start to see that the implications of a philosophy that is abstract really does impact us in our here and now in the most practical of ways, you start to realize you've got to deal with that stuff. You've got to deal with the abstract because the, the fact is that the philosophy that is taught in the academy does trickle down to the common person 
what we're seeing in our culture, in our uh, the major issues in terms of confusion about gender and all sorts of other things in our culture right now, all of that goes back to philosophical conclusions that uh, philosophers have been teaching for quite a long time, but it just takes a while for that to hit the populace. So this has then led to, to the focus of my work really shifting uh, from just theological particulars, which I still care deeply about, but to going back and saying, what are the philosophical basic assumptions that have shifted in both in the, in the change of our theology, but then also in what we're seeing in our culture today? Um, so to talk then about this doctrine of theosis, I really have to discuss a little bit about this philosophical shift. So I'm going to uh, do this as simply and quickly as I possibly can, because I do want to delve into the doctrine itself. That's the exciting stuff, but I do have to uh, get through some of this so you understand why it is that this doctrine uh, started to, to disappear. Um, so uh, maybe we can start with, with Immanuel Kant. And I'm going to blame Kant for a lot. I love to blame Kant. Uh, anybody here tried to read Kant? All right, some of you have. Really easy to read, right? Very uh, quick, uh, fun reading. Uh, he's, he's, very, he's very difficult. Uh, but even if you've never read Kant, uh, and even if you read Kant, that doesn't mean you quite understand what he's trying to, to get at. Um, but you have been influenced by him, whether you know it or not. And that's just the reality. So Kant is kind of, a, he's a late enlightenment figure uh, in Germany. And, and Kant is really trying to reconcile a couple different trends that are going on in philosophy at this time. And you have two broad groups, and there are different figures with different beliefs, but oftentimes, you know, philosophers generally group them into two categories. You've got the, the empiricists and the idealists, okay? And the empiricists are those who believe that knowledge comes basically from our sense experience. Um, so, you know, famously, uh, John Locke says the mind is a, is a tabula rasa, it's a blank slate. So the empiricist would say that, you know, there's really nothing kind of imprinted necessarily on the mind, but uh, the mind gets these impressions on it as you experience. You see, hear, touch, whatever, uh, the different things in your life, and then that those experiences are how you know reality. Um, the, a lot of the empiricists are, uh, are in England. Not all of them, but that's where it's kind of a major movement. Uh, you have this other uh, group of, of thinkers that are, are rationalists. Now, the empiricists can also be rationalists, too, so there, there's a bit of crossover. But uh, you've got the empiricists, and then you've got these uh, what are called idealists. Idealists are those who prize uh, ideas above all else. You know, the ideas are the ultimate reality. So, you know, I, how do I know ultimate reality? I know it by kind of just thinking, kind of getting in my head and thinking through what logically follows what. That's the idealist perspective. So the, the basic question is, how do I know things? Do I know things through what I experience through my senses or what I think in my head? Kant tried to reconcile those two things. He tried to make a system which would take account of both of those realities. Um, but in, in doing so, there's one particular idea I want to talk about here that becomes influential for readings of, of Martin Luther. Uh, and it is important to note that Kant was, he was a, in a Lutheran pietist home. So he, he did have a Lutheran background. And that did form him in some pretty significant ways. It also meant because he's German, raised in a Lutheran family, that means that he influences Lutheran German theology very significantly as well. Uh, and there's a distinction that Kant makes between uh, the noumena and the phenomena. Uh, the noumena is what he calls the ding on sich, the, the thing in itself. Uh, and this is things as they actually are. So the, the thing in itself is what a thing actually is in its essence. The phenomena is how a thing appears to me. Um, so, you know, I could, I could say, you know, here's a podium. Uh, what is actually the essence or nature of this podium in itself apart from me? That's the noumena for Kant, and I don't really know. But what do I know? I know what it feels like to my sense of touch. Um, I would know what it tasted like if I decided to lick it. I won't do that. But, uh, you know, like, you can experience things by your senses, 
But for Kant, that phenomena is all you know. So all I know is my, well, all I can really know for certain, um, and he does have these other truths that are more universal, but we're talking about the, the world that we experience. What we really know for certain is not what the world is in itself, but just how it affects me. So how does this affect our view of Jesus? Well, Kant deals with the question of God and is sometimes considered to be a religious thinker and that he's kind of saving religion in some way for the rationalists because he puts God in his system somewhere. Uh, but generally, God becomes just, just kind of pragmatic. It works better to assume the existence of God uh, because it gives us a kind of fear. So uh, Kant has this emphasis on moral duties. And if you have a God, it's more likely that you're going to obey your moral duties because you have some fear that God might punish you if you don't do them or reward you if you do them well. That's, that's basically the basis for religion, for Kant. That's it. Um, so what does Kant say then about God's actual existence? That's the noumena. That's the thing in itself. That's the realm that I don't access. So who knows? Who knows? That's really where Kant comes. Um, and so there are a number of thinkers that are influenced by Kant. Uh, there are Kantians and then Neo-Kantians. But there's a particular Lutheran figure who's really important in this story, and that is Albrecht Ritschel. Now, if you're going to discuss what is Protestant liberalism in the 19th century, which, I mean, technically, I guess 1799 is the beginning, so just prior to the 19th century. Um, but Protestant liberalism was basically a movement largely among German Protestants, and then it expanded beyond that to say, we can still be Protestant Christians, but also be good rationalists at the same time. We can make a kind of more rational form of Christianity that denies, say, the supernatural. And Kant gives impetus to some of these ideas in Christian liberalism, particularly that of Albert Ritschel. Uh, and, and Ritschel, he is, he is a student of uh, a guy named Hermann Lotze, who's a, a neo-Kantian. So he's kind of a next generation later uh, guy who's drawing on Kant. And Ritschel essentially buys into the major points of Kant's system. He essentially says, he's a, he's a theologian here, not a philosopher. So Ritschel as a theologian says, yeah, the, the church is great. Lut the Lutheran church in particular, he's saying, is necessary for society. Uh, why is it necessary? Because it creates a moral community. Moral community is really the purpose of the church. Uh, and we don't really have access to the truths, like all that abstract stuff about, you know, the Trinity or the preexistence of Jesus, like all that. That's all noumena, right? That's all, that's all stuff that we don't really have any access to. So he's going to focus on what we can understand, what we can experience, particularly in terms of morality for, for ritual. Others, like Schleiermacher does this in terms of like religious feeling and sentiment. Um, but this, so how does this relate to the doctrine of union with Christ? Well, uh, Ritchell has a, a very influential study of Martin Luther's theology. So it's known as Luther's, or Ritchell's Luther study. And he, he devotes a, a significant amount of time reading and reevaluating Luther's writings. And uh, he does this in a, a few different works. He has a, he's got a history of pietism that he writes, which is very critical of, of pietism. Uh, but then he also has this uh, set of two books on the history of the doctrine of reconciliation or justification. Um, and as he's reading Luther, he kind of reads Luther as if Luther was Kant. Like Luther, for him, uh, brings about an understanding that God gives us his free grace as a gift, which then becomes the basis for what he says is the kingdom of God, which is the moral community of the church. Uh, and so the church can be a moral community because it's been set free from the legalism of Rome. And in freedom now, the church can choose to be the moral community of good for the world. That's basically Ritchell's uh, perspective. Now, Ritchell, when reading Luther, runs across all of these statements of Luther where Luther talks about how Jesus is, is present in faith how Jesus mystically unites himself with us. He is in our hearts. There is this, this bond between us and Jesus, this sharing somehow in the divine nature. And Ritual doesn't know what to do with that language. 
because he has already said, basically, we don't have access to God in himself, and that's all abstract stuff. So Kant reinterprets Luther, and essentially he says, when Luther talks about union with Jesus, he's not talking about something real, a real intimate union that he has within me and my soul. Instead, he says, what Luther's actually talking about is that I am, I am united to Jesus in that my moral will becomes aligned with Jesus's moral will. You see that shift there. Now, I have to stop for a sip of coffee every once in a while. So I uh, woke up at 3.30 this morning <laughs> before I took my flight early in the morning. So uh, sorry if I have to stop and, and uh, keep myself awake with some coffee. Um, so after ritual is a movement that's often known as the Luther Renaissance. And there is this revival in studies of Luther. People are really interested in the writings of Luther. Now, prior to this, within Lutheran history, Lutherans were generally writing systematic theology, uh, meaning that Lutherans believed that the Bible was a revelatory text that is self-consistent, which means you can actually, like, look at a passage from Genesis and look at a passage from Romans, and because they're both divinely inspired, you can actually say they're saying the same thing. Well, with the rise of Protestant liberalism, you don't have that anymore because Protestant liberalism says it's a bunch of different authors from different times that have different ideas. There's the Bible self-contradictory, they would say. Um, so among Lutherans then, systematic theology in some ways just becomes study of Luther. So the concern is not so much, what does the Bible say about this doctrine or that doctrine? It just becomes, well, what did Luther say about that? And for Ritchell, one of his primary arguments, and this is in his history of pietism, is that there's Lutheranism, but then there's Luther, and they're totally different. We've got to get rid of the Lutheranism and go back to the real Luther. <laughs> so this is what the Luther Renaissance then is founded upon. So Carl Hole is a major figure here. Um, but they're, they're a group of scholars that go back and say, well, we need to reevaluate Luther. We have been wrongly assuming that the Lutheran tradition after Luther actually understood him. They're starting with the assumption that they didn't get Luther. So we've got to reevaluate him really in light of Protestant liberalism. And it just so happens that everyone reading Luther reads them as if he agrees with whatever their you know, pet concern is. It's amazing. Um, so the Luther Renaissance doesn't really even out of that doesn't even become a consistent view of what Luther taught. I mean, many of these scholars completely disagree with each other on the essence of, of his teachings. Um, but the foundation that Ritchell laid there of this divorce of any real union with Jesus, I, I mean, that's there in all of them. And that becomes just assumed. So when you read Luther's scholarship it, it through, I mean, in recent days as well, uh, hopefully the tide is turning a bit, there's just an assumption that, well, of course Luther didn't mean that. Uh, and some of this is uh, an antipathy towards, uh, toward classical philosophy. Uh, that there is another Protestant liberal, Adolf von Harnack, makes, uh, he, he wrote a, a series of books on church history, which is very well known. Uh, and Harnack promotes what's called the Hellenization thesis, which is basically the idea that um, the New Testament is basically very Jewish, um, but there were these kind of Greek foreign philosophical ideas that had nothing to do with Judaism, and the history of Christianity in a way is people bringing those Greek ideas into Christianity and kind of corrupting it from basically the very beginning. Um, so there is a, on behalf of a lot of the Luther scholars, there's a distrust of classical philosophical categories. Uh, and sometimes it can sound very pious because the argument is, well, that's just pagan philosophy. We're just being biblical. Okay, well, that sounds good. We all want to be biblical. We don't want to be pagans. So like, okay, fine. I won't read Plato anymore. Uh, what happens though, is they're not just being biblical. They're reading rationalist enlightenment philosophy then into the text of scripture. So that what they're not doing is saying, get rid of the, the older philosophy for one that's just biblical. That may be what they say, but in effect, what they're actually doing is just grabbing onto that kind of rationalism of one kind or another, um, which is why Protestant liberalism never stays consistent. You know, you've got people like Rudolf Bultmann who are basically you know, existentialists. He draws largely on Martin Heidegger. 
You've got the rituals who are just moralists. You've got the Schleiermachers who are all about kind of romanticism and feeling. It just shifts with whatever the ideals of the culture happen to be at that time. You know, so now it's like you know, diversity, equity, inclusion kind of stuff under the guise of the gospel. And it's gonna change in 20 years, depending on whatever is popular then. And Protestant liberalism just kind of goes with, uh, you know, kind of goes with the wind, uh, with whatever happens to be cool at the time. Um, so this is my long argument leading up to this point. This is about, you know, I know about half of my time here. Um, to say what went wrong. So I think that's really essential because as you're, you're asking, why don't I hear about this? You're not going to understand that unless you know what happened philosophically and what happened with this understanding of Luther. Um, so until you get to about 1930, and I, I usually put 1930 as kind of the, uh, the end point of the best of, I think, American Lutheranism, at least. Um, and that is 1930 is the year that uh, Joseph Stump publishes this little uh, book called, uh, the, it's a summary of the Christian faith. Uh, I think it's just called, this is just called the Christian faith, um, which is a little kind of systematic theology. And he's got this great section on the mystical union. That's kind of the last real good treatment I could find. And from that point forward, um, there are a lot of reasons for this, but essentially the, the ideas of the German Academy start to infiltrate in effect what Lutherans in the United States are teaching and believing. Um, this is where you get to like Seminex and the LCMS. If you know the history of the LCMS, you have Seminex where basically the ideas of Protestant liberalism enter into the, the Missouri Synod. Eventually, the Synod basically splits. Um, the those who are committed to the confessions retain the seminary, um, and those who are Protestant liberals leave. Now, that may be seen by some as kind of a victory. And okay, I guess in some ways, yeah, I mean, the, the, the Missouri Synod did hold very firmly to the authority of Scripture. No other, like, mainline denominations were able to do that. Um, so something, there's something great about that, certainly. But... The LCMS never dealt with the real issue because they dealt with a lot of kind of topical issues, which are like, well, the authority of Scripture. That's essential. Don't get me wrong. Super important. But the underlying philosophy that led to the rejection of the authority of Scripture is all over the place. Um, so uh, there's a problem in a lot of Lutheran scholarship that is, th that is deeply rooted in Protestant liberalism that we really haven't actually reckoned with. And in some ways, I don't know that there's really much of an ability in a lot of seminaries to reckon with it because we've all gotten rid of our philosophy departments. We're, and, and when that happens, if there's no critical thinking about philosophy, what happens is you just adopt the philosophy as an assumption. That's the philosophy of this age. Always happens every time. Okay, so that's, that's where, we, where we lost. And so when I say things like theosis or this mystical union, and people hear that today and they say, you sound, that doesn't sound Lutheran. That sounds Eastern Orthodox. The reason it doesn't sound Lutheran is not because it's not Lutheran, but because the Lutheranism that has formed people alive today has largely been a post-Kantian Enlightenment Lutheranism. Okay, so what is the doctrine of theosis? <laughs> After all of this background, here's the second half of my talk. Now I'm actually going to get into defining it. Um, and, and that's been a major part of the project is tracing this. So, uh, I, But now I'll get into some of, some of the specifics. So what exactly is theosis? Well, if we're going to summarize theosis, uh, perhaps we could start with what is the most famous statement of theosis. This is uh, in a fourth century work by St. Athanasius uh, on the incarnation of the word. He says this. It says, God became man that man might become God. Now, when I say that, you're probably like, what in the world? <laughs> Have you become a Mormon? <laughs> what, what is happening here? Uh, you know, because that sounds weird. Like, we're not gods. We're human creatures. So what exactly does Athanasius mean? Well, you know, Athanasius is considered a father of orthodoxy, one of the most important theologians who's ever existed in the history of the church. I mean, we have the Athanasian Creed, 
named after Athanasius. He's the most important theologian defending the Council of Nicaea and the Nicene Creed. So this is not just some kind of far off weird guy that's saying this. And despite what some of the Mormons may tell you, <laughs> Athanasius did not literally mean that we become God like God is God. Um, so what exactly did he mean? Uh, well, this, this idea that, that God became man, that man might become God, is referred to as uh, theosis or deification, a process where we are deified. And if this language sounds really strange to you, uh, I just want to, to cite, and there are a number of passages that I want to go to in Scripture, I guess depending on, on time, but um, one particular passage that becomes kind of the foundation for this kind of language is in the book of 2 Peter. So 2 Peter uh, chapter 1, verse 4, Peter says, uh, by which we have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Partakers of the divine nature. Somehow we partake of the divine nature. What does that mean? Well, if you read a lot of people after Kant, they start to say partaking of the divine nature means we align our moral wills with God's moral will. If you know anything about ancient Greek philosophy, particularly that it still existed and was developed in the Roman Empire, you're not going to read language of partaking of the divine nature in that way. A good Enlightenment modernist will read it that way. It's not what Peter meant, and it's certainly not how the Church Fathers understand what Peter is, is trying to say. So in some way, according to Peter, we share in the divine nature. We partake in the divine nature. Does that mean that we literally become God is the question you're always going to run into. Uh, and let me go to another passage that I think illuminates this for us. Um, because, and we can talk a little more about that, that text in Second Peter because I think there's some context that gives some ideas uh, there about what that means because Peter does talk about growing in virtue there uh, and putting on virtue, making effort uh, to live a virtuous life, because we are called as Christians to actually make effort. Um, and, and so, but that flows out of this partaking of the divine nature. Like, because we are sharing in Christ, now we can make effort to live virtuously, because Christ is being formed in us. You know, as St. Paul says, you know, it's not I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Christ is, is in me and, and is acting through me and is the source of any good, virtuous, anything in my life. The source is ultimately Jesus, not me. Um, well, there's a, there's a passage in Paul that I think explains this probably better than any other, this idea of theosis. And that is from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul is talking about the difference between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And he's talking specifically about the the blindness of, of many of the Jewish people who hadn't understood, though, though they read Moses, they don't understand Christ. They don't understand Christ as the center of what Moses is saying. Um, but uh, what I want to look at is one particular part of this argument. So uh, I'm going to start reading in verse 15 here of 2 Corinthians 3, where Paul says, But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their heart. He's talking about the unbelieving uh, Jewish people. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken, taken away. Now the Lord is spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the spirit of the Lord. So, to give some context here of what Paul is talking about, he's referencing a particular Old Testament narrative. And that narrative is, is when Moses is on Mount Sinai uh, before the presence of God. And as he is in the presence of God, the divine presence has a transformative effect on Moses' nature, like in the most literal sense. If you are in the presence of God, that changes you. Well, how does God change him? Does, does he just... Is it just that God, you know, gives them the Ten Commandments and Moses is like, I'm going to try really hard to do that. Thank you for giving me some nice moral support, God. No, like Moses has the glory of God reflected on his face. So his whole image is transformed. 
So the glory that is properly God's, Moses shares in. So you see this partaking of the divine nature? We see how this is played out. Now, Moses doesn't literally become God, right? Moses doesn't come down the mountain and he's now sinless and everybody's worshiping him. But he really does partake in God in some way. Like, God's actual glory is really now on Moses in a way that transforms his very nature. Not in a way that he becomes unhuman. And, and this is kind of a misunderstanding I see uh, from a lot of people. Uh, and usually this is when they're describing Eastern Orthodoxy. And I think it's a misunderstanding of Eastern Orthodoxy, too. Um, but the, the, the criticism is, well, God created us to be human creatures. And Theosis says we be, go beyond creaturely existence to now become something beyond human. No Christian theologian who teaches Theosis teaches that. I've never run into anybody saying that. The, the point is, this is what humans were actually meant to be. We were meant to be those who share in the divine glory by grace. But we do share in the divine glory. That's what Adam was created for. Um, and... You could read some kind of wild descriptions of Adam's state in the garden by some early uh, Lutherans talking about all the blessings and gifts that Adam had because he like shared in the divine nature that, you know, Adam probably had this glory like Moses did. You know, the assumption is like that's when you're in the presence of God, it, it does change you. So we don't change to become less human. We change to become more human because that's what we're supposed to be in the first place. Um, so we're really going back to our humanity, not going beyond it. We can't go beyond it. We're not meant to. But Moses is transformed. And to, to the point that when Moses comes down the mountain, people can't even look at him because the glory is so strong that he puts a veil on his face, which is what he's referencing here with the veil on the heart. Um, so he, Paul then uses that as an illustration of our transformation in Christ, where he says, we all with unveiled face. So he's saying, we're all like Moses who aren't veiled from the glory of the Lord, but we're in the presence of God, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. So like Moses was in the very presence of God, we are in the very presence of God. And he says, we are being transformed into the same image, like Moses was, from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the, the language he's using is saying, this is how our, our transformation works. He's not talking about perfection by any means. He's writing to the Corinthians. They're a hot, hot mess. They're, they're like, I mean, talk about a sinful, messed up church. But he's recognizing that underneath all the sin and all that stuff that's, that's been forgiven, the, the Spirit of the Lord is really at work with the Corinthians. And they really are being transformed. So the story of Moses and then how Paul explains it really helps us to see what Peter means by partaking of the divine nature. Because we don't just have, you know, one isolated text to be like, I don't know what that means. We've got a whole story and narrative of the Old Testament that we can apply to say, here is what we mean. <laughs> and, and so I think Paul does that, does that very well. Um, there, there is one other uh, text that I think helps here that I want to, there are many other texts that help, but there's one other text that I want to look at specifically as we're, as we're talking about this. And that is in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6 begins this discussion of some of the sins of the Corinthians. Uh, particularly, this begins the discussion of uh, the sexual immorality of the Corinthians. You have all sorts of crazy stuff going on in Corinth. Corinth is a pretty wild place. Um, there, you know, there are, people are sleeping with prostitutes. This one guy's like sleeping with his mother-in-law. Uh, and this leads then to Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 explaining marriage and what the purpose of marriage is. Uh, and uh, this begins, though, with this uh, rejection or this, this critique of their sleeping with prostitutes, which you think should be kind of obvious, but it wasn't. Uh, and in some societies, it's actually not that obvious. Uh, they're actually, even in like medieval Europe, prostitution was legal and even defended by people like Thomas Aquinas, strangely enough. It's a side tangent, so I won't go there. Okay. <laughs> Point being, uh, he's talking about fleeing sexual morality, specifically uh, sleeping with, with prostitutes. Uh, and he says here in, in uh, verse 15 of 1 Corinthians 6, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Notice how intimate that language is. That's the language Paul uses, like, we're the body of Jesus, members of Jesus. We're, we're so connected to him, like a part of your body is connected to you. 
That's, that's pretty intimate language that he's, that he's using there. He says, shall then I take members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. So he's talking, obviously, about sexual union here. And he's saying in that union, Scripture uses the language that the two become one flesh. But there, there's some real, as intimate as a union between two people can be that occurs there. He then likens that to our relationship with God. Now, you can take this metaphor too far and do weird stuff with it. Don't do that, okay? It's, it's, it's kind of an analogy here. Uh, so despite what some people do, um, you want to be a little careful with what you do with it. But he says this, but him who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. So he's saying that we are, we are intimate with God in a way that kind of mirrors that intimacy in sex. I think it's an intimacy that's even beyond that. I mean, I think that's the point is that, that sexual intimacy is really a picture of the far deeper intimacy of our relationship with God that, that goes far deeper than this. So this is, we might say, mystical, this kind of language. I know Lutherans shy away from the language of mystical. By the way, they didn't prior to about 1940. So do with that what you will. Um, but we don't like the language of mystical. But I think it is, it is mystical. It's mysterious. There is something supernatural happening here. There's something that goes beyond my senses. There's something that goes beyond what I what I feel, what I taste and touch and see. This real intimacy, this, this real union that we have with God. And, and Paul then goes on to, you, to talk about how, you know, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, who you have from God. You are not your own. Um, and, and then he goes on to say, glorify God in your body. So there's a lot going on here. There's a lot we can tie together in this, in this passage. But it is that, the intimacy of that union with God that the sexual union is kind of based on, or is, is just a, a mere picture of, is the union that is likened to the spirits indwelling us like God indwells the temple. Uh, and that indwelling of the spirit then becomes the motive for how we treat our bodies. So that obedience flows out of that. Now, here, and, and I think Lutheranism today has, and I know I'm like throwing a lot of stuff out here, and, and uh, I'm, I'm throwing some kind of heavy critique maybe at, at modern Lutheranism, but I think this stuff is very important. Um, here's a problem that this has ultimately led to. We have a huge problem in Lutheranism with, with antinomianism, okay? They're just flat out. There's a major problem in Lutheran churches uh, that people think any talk about Christian obedience or sanctification is, is somehow displacing the gospel, that it's necessarily legalistic, that you can never, you know, tell people to actually do good things after you preach the gospel. Um, certainly not how the New Testament talks. If you, if you want to make that argument, take it up with Paul and Jesus, because they do not preach like that. I'm sorry, they don't. Uh, and, and in the history of the Lutheran Church, nobody preached like that till maybe 50 years ago. Okay. Uh, well, almost nobody. You do get the occasional antinomian, but they're called antinomians and not considered orthodox. Here is why this, uh, uh, here is why I think this happens. In classical Lutheranism, you didn't have the, because if you have the doctrine of the mystical union, right, you don't have the problem of legalism in the same way. Because if you're telling people about their sanctification, their obedience, if you understand this intimacy of this union with Christ, what you're really talking about is what Christ is doing. Because you understand, unless you're a Kantian, right? So Kant says, essentially, that good works are moral duties. You have a duty to do good, so you better do it. And that's it. That's all there is to it. I mean, that's legalistic, moralistic preaching, if you use Kant. It's a very different way of preaching to say, we share in the spirit of God. Christ works in and through us. As, as Luther says, we become little Christs to our neighbor. Once you lose this language of participation, participating in God, you've lost the whole basis for Christian obedience. And all that's left is the Kantian moral imperative. So it becomes either justification by grace, which is great, or 
rigorous, you better do good. And that's not Christian. So what it's done is it's forced Lutherans into a position of, of this kind of false dichotomy of, well, it's either justification or you're preaching legalism. Why? Because you're missing the whole point of sanctification, which is Jesus and what he's doing to conform you to his own image. So I think a lot of our problems that we're seeing today really are, are the results of this, this significant shift uh, that, that we've seen within, within the Lutheran tradition with the loss of this, this doctrine of the mystical union. So, um, I know I got like 10 minutes here, but as we're talking about the, then the mystical, uh, I said, I used the term mystical union. So I'm just going to lay out kind of what I mean by the terms, right? So um, theosis is a very popular term, as I said, in Eastern Orthodoxy. Uh, deification is the other very popular term in, in Eastern Orthodoxy. Now, this is generally used to categorize teachings of the Church Fathers, like Athanasius. It's not only in Athanasius, it's in pretty much all of the Church Fathers. It's very significantly in Augustine. Uh, it's very significant in someone like Bernard of Clairvaux, who becomes the most, really most, probably most influential um, popular medieval theologian on Luther, because maybe Towler is a little more influential. And then whoever wrote the anonymous Theologia Germanica, which we don't know who the author is, was very influential on Luther. Uh, but actually, all three of those authors are very theosis-centric theologians. They all talk about participation in God a lot. Now, that doesn't mean that when I am using the term theosis, what I mean by it is exactly what the Eastern Orthodox Church means by it. So, you know, if you go to your you know, local priests, say, in the Orthodox Church of America or whatever, you know, church you have near you, uh, and you ask him about theosis, the answer that he gives you is, you know, the priest will give you is not exactly the same as what I'm talking about here. <laughs> um, so well, I'm not saying that our, this doctrine is the same as what the East is saying. What I am saying, though, is whether you are, are Lutheran or Roman Catholic or Eastern Orthodox, as the more kind of historic traditions, and there are, we could talk about other, the Reformed do to some extent, but um, all of us have roots in the same figures, right? Like we're all reading the same church fathers. And uh, the problem is if we start saying theosis is just an Eastern Orthodox doctrine, you're basically giving the fathers to the Eastern Orthodox. You're basically saying, hey, yeah, the Eastern Orthodox, uh, yeah, they agree with the fathers are, are theirs because the fathers all talk about theosis. I don't think that's the right way to go about it. Because when you read the fathers, they're talking about theosis, we've got all the same stuff in our tradition too. The East goes in a different direction with it. And, and there are, are reasons for that. Some of it in, in the early church, uh, primarily Pseudo-Dionysius, uh, who Luther himself is quite critical of, because Luther sees Pseudo-Dionysius as a uh, kind of a Christless view of divinization. I tend to agree with Luther. I think he's right in his evaluation. Um, and, and Pseudo Dionysius, uh, his book, The Divine Names, and other works become really central for the Eastern Orthodox tradition. Um, and then the East is, is formed through the, the Hesychastic movement and Maximus Confessor, and there are all these other figures that shape the Eastern view. But once we get back to the Athanasius or the Cappadocian Fathers, we're looking at the first you know, five centuries of the church. They belong to all of us. Like they don't just belong to Rome or the East. In some significant ways, I think they uh, belong to us in ways that don't align, uh, depending on the Father, <laughs> with, with those traditions. But um, So what the Lutheran tradition does is largely develops its doctrine of participation with God uh, in the language of the mystical union. So that tends to be the way that Lutherans talk about it. Uh, and uh, in a way, I would say the mystical union kind of is our take on theosis, is the language I would, I would use. Um, so the mystical union is just a way to say, first of all, it's mystical, which I know people shy away from the term mystical because I, I think people have misunderstanding of mysticism. When people think mysticism, they often think of like, maybe like a new age stuff, or they think of like, or like you just need to li listen to God speak in your heart and not read the Bible or something. And Luther's plenty critical and that we call that enthusiasm. Um, mysticism can be that, don't get me wrong, uh, but it can mean lots of other things as well. Um, Luther himself was would largely be considered a mystic in one kind of tradition of mysticism. Um, 
but by the my mystical, we mean that largely there is mystery around what's going on. There is an, an inexplainable nature of this union. Uh, this, this is something that human words can't really grasp at. We just have some analogies. We've got a number of analogies. We've got the, the temple, because we see a picture of that. You know, we obviously got plenty of that in the Old Testament, but Paul used the language of the temple. We've got the sexual union, the marriage union. Uh, we have vine and branches. Right, I am the vine, you are the branches. I don't think the branches are aligning their moral wills with the vine, and that's what that's how they align themselves. Right? No, like he's the life source. They're they're like literally physically connected. So that that's a picture of our literal, real, intimate connection that we have with with Jesus, um, that's being used there. But but ultimately, these are all analogies to get at something that is ineffable. It's it's inexplainable, in its fullness, um, which perhaps is why a lot of people don't like it because we like things that we can explain, right? Uh, and this is something you find in, in the, like the Lutheran Orthodox in the 17th century, where this doctrine really develops in its most precise forms, is that as they're talking about this union, they say a lot more about what it isn't than what it is. Uh, and that could be a little frustrating because you want to know more. But that's kind of what we're left with because it is mysterious. Uh, and... and they do outline some important things, what it's not. One is, it's not you literally becoming God, okay? Um, so I haven't, and I have, Lutherans do, by the way, use Athanasius' phrase, but they usually change it a little bit, okay? Uh, so, um, you know, Gerhard, Johann Gerhard cites it, CFW Walther cites it in a couple sermons, uh, but both of them say, well, I guess two, one says God, uh, the Son of God became man, that man might become sons of God, uh, or God became man that man might become like God, just to kind of put a little clarity. And that's really what Athanasius means, okay? Um, and, and I think the clarification is helpful, especially if you live in an area like, I assume you got a lot of Mormons in this area, don't you? So you don't want to be, want to be a little, little, little careful here, okay? Uh, <laughs> so yeah, but I, but I like that, that rendering of the phrase to say that, you know, the son of God became man that man might become a son of God. I think that gets at really the reality of what Athanasius was, uh, was getting at. So in terms of those negations, they start to say, well, here's what it's not. Uh, it's not you literally becoming God. It's, it's not um, a hypostatic union, which is the language used for Jesus. In other words, you're not united with God in the same way that the human nature of Jesus is united with God. You don't get to say, in other words, because God dwells in you, I am God. That would be blasphemy, okay? That wouldn't be, Jesus can say that, you cannot say that, okay? So there, these are boundaries of orthodoxy around what you can and cannot say. Um, similar kind of language is used when we're talking about how the natures of Christ relate. We're not, what is a divine nature? Well, do you know what a divine nature is? Here, who can give me a, a perfect uh, definition of divine nature? Like, obviously you can't. So how do a human and divine nature actually relate? In its fullness, we don't really know that. We're just using what we know to kind of negate what it's not. <laughs> you know, like, here are the boundaries. Don't talk outside of these boundaries, because you're going to move into heresy one way or another. The, the mystical union is, is very similar. Um, so a, another term that, that I, the, the term that I have used, and I have a book of this title, is Christification. Uh, and the reason I chose that particular title is that I think it really centers us in what we're really talking about uh, in, in this idea of theosis, from, at least from a Lutheran approach, is they're really just talking about what Christ does for us and then in us, which is a result of what he does for us. And that, like, when Athanasius uses this language, the foundation is Jesus' own life. It's not, the foundation is not even you here now. It's objective in what Jesus did for you. Like, he united humanity with divinity in his incarnation. Like there's an accomplished fact of that. And what we experience in life is a, is a subjective, you know, reception of that and living out the reality that is true about Jesus himself. Um, so to keep that kind of Christological center, which is always going to be kind of the Luther's principle, and I think rightly so, uh, that Christification idea gets at, uh, I think, to say we're really talking about something that is true about the incarnation and it's centered on the work of Jesus. Uh, because what you get in some of the, 
the, especially kind of Dionysian. So Pseudo Dionysius, he's called Pseudo Dionysius because there was a Dionysius that traveled with Paul. And um, some early church fathers thought this document was written by that Dionysius because it said it's written by Dionysius. We don't know who the author was or if his name was even Dionysius. He could have just been using that title, but it also wasn't that uncommon of a name. So it very well was just some other guy named Dionysius. Anyway, it becomes associated with the guy that Paul knew, and so therefore it becomes, well, he's mentioned in the New Testament, so what he says is authoritative. Um, but if you, read, if you read Dionysius, there's not, just not a lot about Jesus. There really isn't. Um, it, it's more about mystical contemplation, and that mystical contemplation is uh, largely a contemplation that is a, a kind of lacking of thought. Like you, it, it's apophatic theology, and there's some truth to it, but... Uh, essentially the way that we know God best is by negating our ideas about God because God is beyond thought. He's beyond any limited concepts that we have. Um, and, and of course there's truth to that. Certainly the New Test and Old Testament use language of what God is not. And it's true that our language doesn't grasp him. We speak analogously about God. Um, but at the same time, I don't, I just don't see that language about our spiritual life and prayer urged in the New Testament. I just, don't. Um, so I think our, our focus in this always has to be on, on Jesus. And so I'll say this, kind of in, in summary, how does this, you know, theosis work? <laughs> uh, I think when we're looking at what Paul says to the Corinthians, he speaks about being in the presence of God and God transforming us, right? It's Moses on the mountain. Ultimately, where are you in the presence of God? Where do you see the presence of God? In his word, in the sacraments, the gift of the body and blood of Christ and the Holy Eucharist, that's where you receive Jesus. That, that's where you meet God. So when I'm talking about this, this idea of theosis, uh, I'm not talking about this mystical separate contemplation of like you going alone on a you know, mountain somewhere. Um, not that you, you can go ahead, go on, there are nice mountains around here. Go ahead, go on a mountain and pray. That's great. Uh, but, but the root of everything is being before Christ and receiving him where he has uh, promised to be. And as a result of that, he forms himself in us as we are conformed to his image. All right, thank you.